Hi everyone, um, welcome back to book club. It's book club Fridays, I'm very excited to be back. Um, and we're just coming off of Pride Month, you know, amongst everything else that's going on in the world, we're still celebrating Pride Month. And um, in light of that, I wanted to bring on my friend who's a writer, activist, photographer, Io Tillett Wright, the one and only, um, who wrote a beautiful memoir in 2016 called Darling Days, which I had the honor of reading for the first time this week. Um, I think I was calling Io like every day, just being like, I'm crying again. I'm still crying, still crying, can't stop crying. I just stopped crying for this. So um, for those of you who haven't read it, it is so beautiful and I really, really, really recommend it. Um, you know, and like many books written by queer writers, what Io was explaining to me is that, you know, they get labeled as LGBTQ plus books um, and kind of just pushed into that section of a bookstore, for example, when, you know, really there's so much more to these stories. Um, you know, especially Darling Days, it's a human story. It's a New York story. Um, and it's just kind of about growing up and out of the life that you're born into, just like Ayo did. Um, so before I bring Ayo on, I just kind of want to give a brief description of the book and kind of gush about him without him here getting embarrassed. So um, Darling Days was actually Ayo's first book and it kind of dissects the culture and identity of New York City um, while also exploring the instincts that shape us as kids and teenagers and sons and daughters um, and just as outsiders in general. And it also dives into how the norms and expectations of society can kind of hold us back, which um, I have definitely did not let that happen to him. And I think it's very important and inspirational to read this book if you've ever felt like an outsider, which I know most of us have. So, um, you know, it's one thing to have a great story and an important story like Io has, but it's another thing to have the voice to tell it. And I was really able to tell that story and um, really in a way that makes us live it alongside him. So I really felt like I got to grow up with Io this past week, <laughs> which was kind of awesome. Um, I wanted to read a few of my favorite quotes from the book before and then I will bring on Io because I'm sure you guys are sick of hearing me talk. So um, one quote that stood out to me was, understanding of happiness and built my own world, I finally grasp the beautiful gift that is the lens I possess. Through it, I can see that instead of a mom, I have been given a moral compass. Now, I think that really speaks true for a lot of us. Um, you know, some of the most valuable lessons that we learn from our parents are the places that they've made mistakes. So I think, you know, that couldn't have been put more beautifully, not holding that against your mother, but um, using it as a moral compass. Um, what a great way to look at that. Io. <laughs> um, another one is, I don't want to wear my tragedies on my skin, in my teeth, in my walk. I want something different than what I'm inheriting, but I'm going to have to make that happen for myself. Now, I just thought that was very powerful. Not all of us are dealt the right cards, um, and so I think it's kind of about dealing your own cards and making those opportunities for yourself, which Io has done so beautifully. Um, and I really liked that, you know, he wasn't going to use his tragedies as an excuse. Um, another one, which I just felt was like very poetic and beautiful is there, but for the grace go I that I was not down there looking up. That one doesn't even need an explanation. <laughs> Um, so I guess I'll bring on Io now because who better to hear it from than the legend himself? Oh no. Hi. Hi. Did you like my introduction? Yo, move over, Barbara Walters. I, <laughs> I feel like I have a new career path interviewing people. I kind of love it. 1000%. Bye bye, modeling. Hello, interviews. Hello, interviews. I also thought it was funny because we were joking about the other day how, like, we're not going to name names, but one of our mutual friends hasn't read your book. <laughs> and um, 
and they were saying that you know they don't really like to read or watch their friends work i'm the complete opposite like if i need someone i will go all the way back to your like fifth grade book report and read it so i was so happy when i found that there was like a massive book about everything in your life that i could read i always joke it's like if you are bored with the book you can use it as a weapon to knock somebody out if they attack it's you. heavy <laughs> it's a it's a i mean in more ways than one one week that's nuts oh yeah if i said i slept last night i'd be lying but it. <laughs> it's I'm such a good book thank you kaya so do you kind of want to introduce yourself and what you do who you are and kind of give like a little overview of the book for the people sure um my name is io i uh io till it right I am, God, I do, I've done everything once. <laughs> like, I made a podcast called The Ballad of Billy Balls. I wrote this book. I have done some TV hosting stuff. I have a long history of activism. I have fought for marginalized communities in one way or another basically my whole life. And um, yeah, I was born and raised in New York and had this weird life. And uh Nobody really knew that. And then I started this big portrait project where I was photographing 10,000 people in all 50 states. And it's been like 10 years of doing this thing. Somebody was like, you should write a book about that experience. And I was like, well, there's all this other stuff that I could write a book about. And they were like, <laughs> so that's how Darling Days happen. So I do a lot. Of, I'm just Io. Hi. Just Io. <laughs> just Io. <laughs> and I also like, in reading the book, I. I read that when you were at boarding school, I mean, you literally have been everywhere and done everything. I was like, all right, now he's here. Now he's here. He's in <laughs> Germany. He's in England. Um, but you were saying when you were at boarding school and they denied um, accepting a black person because of their hair and you actually started a campaign at your school when you were like 15, um, which I thought was so amazing that you were already being an activist in your school at 15. It was such bullshit. It was such what? like, this kid came to visit who, so first of all, like, for those who haven't read the book, the school was like 50, I think 55 kids or 57 kids the first year, and from 26 different countries, and all in this like, beautiful white house on a hill in the middle of sheep fields in the middle of nowhere in England. So like, nothing on nothing on nothing on nothing. Mm -hmm. And despite all of this global diversity, there were no black students. And I was from New York City and I was like, sorry, there's a lot of melanin missing here. Like what's yeah. going on? And this kid came to visit who had long dreads. He was such a beautiful person and such a kind, like everyone at the school connected with it. He was just like one of those magnetic, magical humans where like, mm -hmm. every sorry about this. Oh, this walk we took out by the, blah, 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 blah. and like everybody loved him and they mm -hmm. decided in and we all were like what why and then they told us because his dreads might offend a visiting like board member or whatever from india or something and i flipped out and like started the campaign that ended up getting kicked getting me kicked out which is also crazy that that <laughs> campaign got you kicked out but like i mean the fact that you are already you do so much amazing work now you're a huge part of like what inspired me to get involved but you know, the fact that you were doing that at 15 years old is like way more than most of us can say. So props to you for that. Way, you know, Tandi Way is out there changing the game right now. She's I mean, activism, so. I, I mean, got like when I was 13, I had no idea what was going on. I'm so like proud to see these 13, 14, 15 year olds out there like educating me and their parents. It's amazing yeah yep. you were ahead of the game is what i'm gonna say <laughs> um so i kind of wrote out some questions for you because i'm a professional interviewer now yeah. um so kyle. i wanted to just yeah kyle walters <laughs> um so i think writing a memoir is like a very brave thing to do especially because you're so young um but you've also lived so many lives so what made you choose writing as a way to tell your story and was it kind of difficult to dig up some of those more painful memories from your past? 
Um, I think by it being brave to write a memoir so young, you mean it's embarrassing to write a memoir so young. I should. I not... don't think it's embarrassing, especially because this was every single page had like a new country in it that you were living in. So definitely like had you have waited a couple of years, you wouldn't have been able to, it would have been in an encyclopedia. Like you would not have been able to fit this in a book. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It would have been too long. It would have been, <laughs> it's already too long. Uh, you know, it wasn't my idea. I've always kept journals and like, I, we didn't, you know, as you now know, I wasn't allowed to have screens of any kind. So there was no, there also wasn't a lot of electricity all the time. So like books were where I went, books and like fantasy inventions. Um, and like when things got really dark, I would read and I would journal. So I had always kind of writing was like my most natural form of expression. And I mentioned before, like this portrait project, I, I was figuring out my place in the world when I was like 24. And I started this thing and I, I was asked to do a TED talk. And when I did my TED talk, I was like, oh, maybe I'm gonna like step into speaking. And I reached out to a friend who was a, a book agent. And he was like, have you thought about writing a book about your life? And I was like, yeah, when I was 50. And he was like, well, think about it now. Now. And I just started writing and he was like, oh, you're a writer. And I was like, if you say so, <laughs> you know? And uh, that kicked off this process that took me, God, it was like two years of solid writing. And then like four, I'd say it was like four years from start to finish, three, four years from start to finish. And it was, excruciating it like completely rewired my whole right. system because also the book is written first person present so it's not like oh and then it, it you don't have the lens of like adult reflection it's like no i didn't pick up the phone and call for help i am picking up the phone and calling mm -hmm. which means you have to like walk back through all of your crazy traumas yeah you know? relive it i mean it's Torture. cheap there <laughs> I got paid to go to therapy for three years, basically. But no, it was good. It was like a really, it, honestly, like that kind of trauma and that kind of history, if you don't excavate it and you don't mm -hmm. deal with it and you don't address the hard wiring that you have from being, growing up with addicts or growing up with uh, mental illness and poverty and like all of these things, it'll run you for the rest of your life. Right. So, you can't bury it successfully. No, no. And we see people all over, all of, all the time trying to bury it and trying mm -hmm. to pretend it's not, doesn't need to be dealt with or trying to drink it away or work it away or achieve mm -hmm. it. Doesn't work. No, no. And you, as you were saying, like you write these stories in such detail that, you know, reading it, you also feel like you're living it alongside you. Um, and it kind of invites the readers to walk through your childhood with you. So did you, you were saying you kept a journal. So did you just write everything, you know, from when you were a child on so that you could kind of go back to and refer to when writing this book? Cause everything's like you recall it so well. Well, the other thing that I had was that my mom was a really obsessive photographer. So mm -hmm. she took thousands, I think she had 2000, 3000 photos that I scanned. So I like went to her crazy <laughs> house. She still lives in the same place on third street where I grew oh, up. Wow. And I went to her house and was like, Ma, I'm taking your photo collection. And I'm going to scan it, which to this day, she wants to have me like skinned and hanged for taking her photo collection out of her house. But I took all of her <laughs> and scanned them all. And like, you know, the richness of detail in a photograph just like can't be topped. So I had all these like references for what people looked like and what mm -hmm. place like and I could draw from that. So... That was also really intense because like, when I started writing the book, I hadn't come out as trans. And mm -hmm. so people like, I was confused and like, didn't really, I just like knew I didn't fit in and didn't know what was going on. And then I was like, scanning all these photos and found this like photo of myself at two years old, like flexing at the pool, <laughs> like, like huh. influenced and corrupted by society. And he seemed to be going on, so. Yeah. yeah, it is crazy how it's like, our younger selves know and then it's kind of everything that society teaches us that makes us like crawl back into our shells and like we actually tend to then go against our instincts and like you know 
our gut feelings of like who we really are. I feel like we know who we are from when we're born. Yeah, and we it gets beaten out of us by expectation and bullying and societal whatever the fuck. It's it's cool, honestly. Like your generation and kids younger than you, like I see there's like a new kind of. I don't know, people have like less tolerance for bullshit and less tolerance mm -hmm. for societal garbage. There's like so much yeah. fluidity, so much more sexual fluidity and like, there's still so much shame. I mean, like queer kids are still trying to kill themselves at higher rates than anybody else. But like, yeah, I have, y'all give me hope. <laughs> I know, well, I think it's cause, you know, and I've heard people say, oh, like so many more people, you know, more trans kids, more queer people. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We've always been here. It's just yeah. the fact that now people feel comfortable enough to speak about it and to come out. And I think that's such a beautiful thing is that the internet has given everyone a platform where you can find people and you don't feel like you're the only person within your community who feels this way. And like, yeah. that's one of the biggest positives of social media, I think is like, you can't be ignorant anymore to what's going on in the world. I even hear my parents, you know, using the right pronouns and it makes me so proud that i'm like wow you guys really have invested time into this I, it's amazing that you know i think generally generationally it's been getting even more and more um open and accepting and i've just loved that sounds like new york here right now with all these sirens it's a triggering sound i'm sure um but did you ever consider fictionalizing your story like i feel like a lot of writers do that to sort of separate themselves from the reality of it um i think i have learned in my many iterations of careers and like things that i've explored that vulnerability is a superpower and like if i can't find the strength to stand in my own shoes and tell my own story, then how can I tell anyone else that they should? Right. You know? And like the idea of it being brave to be open about being trans or it being brave to be open about being queer or having come from nothing or whatever. It's like, I'm always kind of like, I, I reject that because it's, mm -hmm. it's like a, the implication is that there's something wrong there or that there's right. something not normal or yeah you know, but what and is normal I, there it, it there isn't there is no shouldn't be. so i um no it was you know of course it's a question in the beginning and there's also the question of like other people's privacy and like right my, so i went to my parents and i asked i was like you know look I, this thing is on the table and i don't want to do this without your permission or your blessing and it, you know, I decided my strategy was to air my own dirty laundry in the same way that I aired anybody else's so that it was a fair and equal vulnerability. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, nah, I felt I've, I've always felt that like, my job in the world and my purpose here is to be honest and to be transparent so that like, if I make mistakes, I own them. You know, like, I don't really jive with cancel culture because... Mm -mm. I feel like it's so based in shaming and so based in like just anti-growth, which is I think anti -human. Yeah, it doesn't allow people to admit their wrongdoings and grow from it. I think that's... Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Especially if like somebody like you who's had a camera on them since they were a child, like how is there supposed to be any space for mistakes and growing? I believe in nurture. So I believe that like if I make a mistake and I fuck something up, then like, let's talk about it and let's right. move through it and grow past it and move on. So if I've done something in my past, I've done all kinds of shit in my past. I sold <laughs> shit on people. I like, you know, I got arrested for stealing clothes and food because I was starving. Like, sue me, you know, like, mm -hmm. like happened. And I don't, uh, yeah, I don't believe in deading people for making mistakes. I think we yeah. should all so. completely i especially think like generationally through your parents like i think a lot of the younger generations are very quick to shut down um you know people who just don't get it or you're like you don't understand i'm not going to explain it but it's like we have to allow for that open conversation in order to you know widen everyone's horizons and and reach a point in the world where people are understood and mm -hmm. accepted because if we're so quick to shut people down then that doesn't allow for people to learn and grow 
Yeah, and also, like, if I write a book about my life and I'm not willing to own that it's mine, then, like, what message is that sending to a kid? Right. Who Completely. Gotta own your shit. Own your shit, girl. Own your shit. <laughs> um, so I think that actually leads into, like, people talk about the idea of present presenting yourself to the world one way, and then you see yourself a different way or you act a different way in private. And, you know, you even said your mom had a night personality and a day personality. Do you think everyone to some degree kind of experiences that sort of multiple versions of themselves? And how do you think that the way society kind of expects people to be changes the way that we present ourselves to the world? I'm sorry, I'm distracted by envisioning your future career as a <laughs> of intellectuals. <laughs> that question is so good. Thank you. Uh, Yes, I think that what we are all striving for as humans, like the human condition is like us trying to meld the version of ourselves that we see with the version that is in the mirror when we look in it, you know? And like trying to make our intentions match up to our act, trying to be, trying to verbalize what we feel and even like, you know, I, I lived as a boy, as a boy from six to 14, so eight years. And I still didn't know that I was trans. Like I still right. buried so deep, you know, I still was like, this is not my reality. I don't want this. I that like, no, I'm just a, I'm a queer girl or I'm a gay girl or whatever. And it just, no matter how wrong it felt, no matter how off it was, mm -hmm. I denied it and stuffed it and buried it. So even finding the self, like there's like, I feel like there's this notion that like we, hi we have our night self that we hide and our day self that we show. But the truth is the night self, we sometimes hide from ourselves. Exactly. Often hide from ourselves because we're told even from like within our own households, our parents, our siblings, our family, our friends, that like the night self is shameful and I think that's what leads to a lot of addiction and that's what leads to a lot of like if you can't own who you really are then you hide who you really are and bury who you really are but the truth is that like your real self comes up at some point and is gonna grab you by the back of the head and fucking body slam you yep. like no running away from yourself no and that's the hardest thing is to try to hide from yourself because that's like the loudest voice is the voice in your head and then trying to silence that you're only asking you know for for issues because you're not going to silence it it will always win you know when my I figured out I was trans when I was like 27 or 28 my assistant at the time for my photo project he's like a six three flaming gay boy always like full like sparkly nails literally every day and I've known this kid for like almost 10 years now mm -hmm. he uh like Tyler you know and he, we were on a plane together and I was reading uh GQ and he was reading Cosmo with like Katy Perry on the cover he like looks at me and he goes can I ask you something I was like sure and he's like do you see yourself in those guys and I was like I'd never even thought about it that way and I was mm -hmm. like yeah, don't you see yourself in Katy Perry? And he was like, no. And then we got mm -hmm. on our layover and he was like, when you go to bed at night and you're done with your like daily performance of gender or whatever and everything for other people and it's just you and the darkness and your body, what do you feel like you are? And it was just like, wow. <sighs> And I was like, wait, is that the barometer? Like, is that how you know? Because if that's the measure, like I have always been a boy my entire life. And I've just been like trying to do this dance to prove some shit to other people because I didn't come in the right form, whatever. And he was like, <laughs> and I basically- I don't like, want to be the one to tell you this, but- <laughs> Yeah, he's like, I'm not saying it, but like, you know. Wow. But what a beautiful way to kind of explain it because yeah, it's like 
you see yourself in the world and and that kind of dictates then how you think you should act or who you think you should be but it's like when you're alone with yourself without anyone there without any expectations it's like well, who do you want to be who do you feel like yeah who do you see when you look in the mirror and that's the important thing and that's like everything that i do that's why when people ask what i do i'm like fight for people to be themselves like if it's mm -hmm. on mp if it's writing a book or if it's shooting a levi's campaign like whatever my whole shtick always is just like making us you feel right with you because then i'm then the world can operate from love right so, and there, there's space for everyone you just have to like i think yeah. create that space within yourself first exactly and if you find it within you and you get right with you, then you will magnetize people who love you for you. And then everything starts to kind of click and fall into place. Suddenly you're happy. Suddenly you're having a good time. Suddenly you <laughs> like life. And then you can like start doing work for other people. You can start getting involved in activism. You can start like mm -hmm. creating love in the world. Because you want to inspire people to have that same positive experience you know, as you did, and maybe a bit sooner than you did. That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I also think, like, bringing it back to your parents, who I feel like were, you know, for the most part, really just wanted you to be happy, regardless of if you came to them as a boy, as a girl, you know, gay, straight, whatever it was. And um, I really was moved by, you know, their acceptance of you. And, you know, but there's also a lot of points in the book where it's clear that you as the child are taking care especially of your mother um do you feel like that affected how you care for yourself and prioritize your own needs and what lessons do you feel like you learned from her and kaya with the zingers <laughs> um yes that is very very astute i um I think anyone who grows up with or has spent any time in proximity to addiction or mental illness knows what a big um, thing that is in the room, like how much air that sucks out of any room because it's a crisis. And it's like you, the focus is on solving the crisis all the time. So if you grow up in a household with that where that's chronic, then you like your hardwiring of your brain is so that you can solve a crisis at any time, which also means right, damage that, control. Yeah. And always being aware of everyone else, because if you don't know what version of someone is going to come through the door, you have to be hyper attuned to be able to read people's micro expressions in a different way, because it's literally your survival depends on it. Absolutely. What that can often produce is like, a much a, a skew towards caring for others instead of caring for yourself. So I was 15 and I learned how to use a fork and knife when I was 13. Like I was a wolf child before that. I would just like stab shit. I would sit like I was in jail with my arm around my plate and I would sit and like <laughs> in my face, I was like, you know, and I didn't know what deodorant was. Like literally my first girlfriend when I was 15 was like, I love that story so much. <laughs> you know, like, we need to talk about this. Because, I, you know, and even into my 20s and, like, as I was getting closer to 30, I was like, what do I even like? Like, I don't know what my taste is. I don't know what mm. I want to wear. I don't know what food I like. Because I was so consumed with making sure that this person was not going off the rails or wasn't dead or wasn't, you know, hurting herself or whatever. So yeah, I mean, it like, I think growing up with addiction and mental illness, like really designs your brain in a certain way. And you have to undo it if you want to have a different kind of life where you like, totally. have to gain that trust and that, you know, feeling safe. Again, I think that's like some of the biggest things that you literally do have to rewire your brain. So that isn't carried into like every relationship that you have after that, even with friends, with everyone. That is so it because it, that's exactly where it really kicks you in the proverbial nuts is like in your relationships with other people, because you find yourself unable to love and really accept love. At least in my experience, I was like, what the fuck is going on? Like, why can't I? Right 
figure out how to like be really good to people and accept love without like spinning and paranoia and worrying about right. shit. or like if i'm not actively trying to save this person why do they really love me do they really need me exactly right exactly and then oh my god like now i'm in a relationship with a person who is like a completely self-possessed oh yeah but you've met her you know she needs no <laughs> help doing anything mm -hmm. as a matter of fact she's like get out of my face like yeah you know, busy and that like not to have to carry somebody that is a gift a huge gift and i think once you can accept that you know you're only there because you love each other that's what real love is is that you choose to be there you don't need each other but you love each other and you want to be there for each other like i think that's the goal kaya gerber 18 going on <laughs> you're a remarkable human being Aww. um well, also, I, I heard in reading this, because one of my favorite books is Just Kids, and I kind of felt a little bit of just, like, the love story of New York reminiscing on reading Just Kids for the first time. Have you read that, or had you read that, and do you kind of see the similarities? And just, like, especially, I think, using New York as one of the key characters in the book. It's almost like that's part of who raised you, is New York City. Oh, my God, 100%. Um, yeah, my... Uh publisher published just kids oh <laughs> when i like nailed it you nailed it you went straight to the heart of it when i went to go meet with him he was the last publisher that i met with and he's like a six three like very tall skinny older jewish guy with a big white afro and he's just like cool and downtown mm -hmm. new york you know and he worked on just kids with patty for like i think 10 years before she finally published it and i was like if he published just kids point. even sneeze in my direction you know <laughs> like clicked yeah it's the same it's like a love story to new york and it's also like you know this book is a love story between me and my mom mm -hmm. and so it's, yeah i feel like you know it it's a love story and it's done so beautifully but it also isn't hiding you know anything and i that's what i love so much about the book is it's like yeah i she can have done this and we could have gone through this and I still love her and she's still my mom. And, you know, we still have a great relationship. And I think that's like the beautiful part of this book is that it isn't, you don't hold this against her. You kind of state what happened. Um, but yeah, if someone told me that they published just kids, I would like get on my knees for them and just be like, whatever you want from me, I'm not a writer, but like I will write, yeah, a thousand pages for you. Um, and, you know, in making New York kind of one of the key characters of the book, how do you feel like New York played a part in, you know, your art, your writing, your photography? Like, how do you think New York shaped you as a person? The New York that I grew up in, like, I was born in 1985. So the New York that I grew up in, like, I was born on the same block as the Bowery Hotel, which used to be a gas station that we got. <laughs> crazy Indian food, radioactive vindaloo at in the middle of the night. You know what I mean? Like it was like, there were these like two mangy dogs that were just like my like pets that were so dirty that I like, called them like blue and green or something. It was like, they were disgusting. And the New York that I grew up in was like the Hells Angels were on the next block and, and everything was wild and dirty and our whole block was low income housing. You know all of this now, but um Okay, I know everything about you now. <laughs> I know, and I think I'm like she knows I lost my virginity. Okay, okay. Oh yeah, <laughs> twice. Twice, uh, actually. Yeah. Both times. Uh, um, <laughs> New York that I grew up in was diverse, like really diverse in the sense that everybody who was too weird to be somewhere else came to New York. Mm -hmm. So, if you were gay, if you were trans, if you were black, if you were Puerto Rican, if you were mentally ill, if you were anything other than very norm core middle America, you had to escape to one of the coasts. So everybody came to New York. So like all of the artists, all of the musicians, it was like high culture and like the, the best bands right down the street and the best painters were friends with my parents and the best filmmakers. My mom, I started acting when I was two and like I, my movie debut was Uma Thurman's movie debut and Steve Buscemi played my dad and my mom played my mom you know it's like 
what? Like, but it was, yeah. But at the same time, there was all this poverty and mental illness. So it, you know, going to public school, we share a, a, an affinity for public schools, but like going to public school in New York in the nineties was wild. So it, it just gives you a worldview around what's out there, like what's normal that most places don't, they don't expose you to that much difference. So there was like no chance for me to grow up to be a bigot because my, all, the world around me didn't look like me. You know, I was the only like, there were like five white people on my whole block. So there was no opportunity for me to really become a dickhead, I guess. Well, okay, that's not true. There were a lot of opportunities for me to be <laughs> I was but, like, you had every excuse to be a terrible person. And the fact that you're like, as incredible and wonderful as you are, just proves that like, no one has an excuse to be an asshole. If you're not an asshole, no one's allowed to be an asshole. <laughs> That's what I'm, I'm saying. I'll fight that next time we fight. <laughs> I said, I'm not an asshole. <laughs> I'm like, and whenever someone's mean to me, I'm like, well, I was not mean to me. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, your parents are gonna hate me. <laughs> <laughs> I think my brother's probably really gonna hate you. Uh, um, no, but I honestly like reading this book was so it just I had no idea. Like I can't believe and I know we kind of just started to get to know each other, but the fact that I had no idea that any of this, you know, like you don't use this, um, your story kind of as an armor or an advantage or anything. It's just kind of like made you who you are but it's also never been an excuse for you and I think the fact that like people can know you and not know you know this has happened to you and everything that you've been through and the places that you've lived and everything with your parents like I think that's such an incredible thing that you can show your friends if they want to read it <laughs> 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 that you know like this is a huge part of me but it's also not you know who you are it's just part of what, what makes you who you are yeah, that's always been really important to me to like, I think also because my mom went through such a big trauma, like the, the mm -hmm. podcast it is about the murder of the love of her life and investigating this murder because when I was growing up, it was the ghost in the house was this guy, Billy, who was her love of her life, who was right. shot by the police three years before I was born. So it was like, I grew up with this like really deep understanding of how unresolved shit can deeply affect not only the people around you, but like your legacy, your lineage, your children. And yeah. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to, I also just like really value kindness. Mm -hmm. I think probably like, number one if you ask me what I value in people it's like if you're not kind but we can't hang you know mm -hmm. I don't really have any interest in hanging if you're not kind which is you know ties into what we were saying earlier about cancel culture it's like I believe in nurture and mm -hmm. I found that if you use your suffering to separate yourself from other people my pain is worse than yours my experiences were worse than yours all it does is really isolate you. And, and like our friend Future says, it makes an island of you. And mm -hmm. I don't, I find that honestly to like, it costs me the most to right. separate. To isolate yourself. Yeah, so I, I find it just like a much more fun, fulfilling way to, to live, to find commonalities with people than differences. Totally. Shout out Future, by the way. <laughs> yeah, holler Future. Holler, future. <laughs> Oh, future. hang out with people two days in a row and they're just like i never want to see anyone ever again <laughs> <laughs> they're leading a revolution right now they're a little busy yeah yeah i saw that they were on here though and i was like wow yeah are they time out of saving the world to listen oh. to our book club is amazing um but you know thank you so much for doing this i think it was like i didn't expect it because brandon told me to read your book. He's like, oh, you should read Ayo's book. And I was like, oh, cool. I didn't even know that he had written a book. And then I'm, I start reading it and immediately I'm like, how? I mean, I just didn't expect any of it. And um, I loved reading it. I got through it very quickly, as you know. And um, now I know everything about you. 
<laughs> You're all blink, blink. I know everything about you. Brown <laughs> three. <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally a psycho. I, I also have d done more deep diving into your podcast and stuff as well because uh, I love that. My favorite was the other night you were like, "Who read? Who did the audio book?" And I was like, "This guy, Astrum." I know because I started listening, and you say it's I tell it right, but I thought you know that the person reading it was just like reading from the book. So I'm like, oh, that's so crazy. And you know, you do this crazy impression of your mom on the audiobook that I was like, if this really isn't IO talking, this person's very bold to deep dive that much into an impression of someone who isn't their mother. I'm like, only a child can impersonate their mother like this, you know, without getting killed. So yeah, no I, but then I asked you and you're like, no, that's me. Crazy. Yeah, it's very disorienting. It's very weird to hear my old voice. Like, I might have to re-record it now. Just I think you should. Well, I also, because I listened to so much of it, like, I was, after finishing, I was like, I don't know if I can ever hear that person's voice again. And then I was like, oh, wait, I literally oh. never have to. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Oh, it doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Gone, but it's amazing. And, um... Thank you for sharing your story with everyone. Thank you for having a book club, Kaya. Like, what a dope thing to do. Not enough It's people. honestly my favorite thing. It's my favorite thing ever. I love doing it so much. And if, being able to, like, talk to people like you. And, like, I, had no, I would have had no idea that this was your childhood and your experience growing up unless, you know, this happened. So... You're making curiosity cool, and I appreciate it. I think if we were all a little bit more curious about other people's experiences, we'd be doing better in the world right now. But oh, yeah. you're out of yeah. with us every day, every week, all Oh, the time. yeah. Every Wednesday, Justice Hall. Every Wednesday, Hall of Injustice. <laughs> Is that what we're calling it now? Uh, yeah, that's what uh, Kendrick calls it, and I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adopt the it. The Hall of Injustice, I like that. Well, Check. everyone's day at the Hall of Injustice. And I think I'm going to bring umbrellas next time for people because it's getting really hot there. <laughs> yeah, it's roasty toasty. Well, thank yeah. you for reading my book, Kaya. And thank you for all your deeply thoughtful questions and caring. And, you know, you're just rapidly becoming one of my favorite people. <gasps> <Thank> you. <laughs> <laughs> you already are my favorite person, but... Thank you. That means a lot. And um, I will, I'm actually now going to force everyone who hasn't read your book to read it. My mom's already started it. I was like, mom, uh <laughs> I have to read this. <laughs> oh my God. Moms, when they read my book, they're like, they take their kids' phones and are like, I just want you to know that I want to feed you. <laughs> your mom's are you hungry? Food, I swear it's going to happen. Just wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, hopefully she'll have the same experience reading it as I did, which was lovely. So thank you. I won't take up any more of your time, but um, I love you, and I will see you probably on Wednesday at the Hall of yeah. Injustice. <laughs> you will. Uh, I'll see you there. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. <laughs> All right. Well, I owe everybody. Um, seriously, please read this book if you haven't. Um, it's very moving. Like I said, I just stopped crying right before I started this. Um, and I'll probably start crying after this too, just because of how much I love and appreciate Ayo for sharing his story and just for being the person he is. Um, it's very inspiring and I'm getting emotional already. So I am going to go everyone have a really good weekend and we'll be back next week with something else new and exciting and fun. <laughs>